everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour, Compilation, Volume 2. The first three stories you'll hear are brand new. I really appreciate you listening. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to The Darkest Hour, and tap the bell so you never miss a thing. So, let's get started, shall we? Okay, so about 11 or 12 years ago, when I was 15 or 16 years old, still living with my parents, I would stay up after they went to sleep and sneak out to my dad's truck to listen to my CDs. My religious parents weren't very accepting of my taste in bands like Paramore and Flyleaf. So edgy, I know. Anyway, on a particularly bad night of fighting with my parents, I waited for the clear took my favorite CD, Flyleaf, and snuck outside. Before trying to somehow crank the truck without waking anyone, I realized I forgot my soda. I went to go back and I leaned on my CD and snapped it into three pieces. I remember it looked odd to me, how the pieces looked so even. So now, more upset than before, I went inside for my drink and to grab a different CD. Can't remember what I picked. And when I returned to the truck, there was my flyleaf CD, not in pieces or even a scratch. Looked brand new, actually. Freaked out and confused because it had been broken five minutes before. I just decided to call it a night. Also, something I left out about earlier on the same day. I noticed that the rearview mirror on my dad's truck was cracked up really badly. My mom said that she'd swiped a light pole. But when I snuck out to listen to music, I realized it was no longer cracked. I just assumed somehow that they must have left without me noticing and had it fixed. But working in the auto industry now, I didn't see how that was possible. It would have been a special ordered part. Anyone else ever experienced something like this? So, today I was in my kitchen. I live in a small loft and the smallest bedroom is like three feet from the edge of the island counter in my kitchen. I saw my two-year-old walk from down the hallway where I'd last seen her and into my daughter's room. I literally watched her for several seconds as she walked in my line of sight, into the room, and out of my line of sight. Something seemed off, but I was distracted with my task, so I just immediately told my 13-year-old, hey, toddler in your room, so she could check it out. 13-year-old was in the living room, which is joined to the kitchen area, so it didn't take but 20 seconds for her to get into her bedroom. She was like, uh, toddler isn't in here. So we checked together, and she, the toddler, was still in her little bed in my room at the end of the hall, just vibing. Then it hit me. What was wrong Toddler was wearing a pink footless zip-up sleeper today. When I saw her, she was wearing a teal blue sleeper with popsicle prints that she wears often. Being distracted, it didn't really click. Also, weirdly enough, she's a heavy walker, and when I saw her a minute before, she made no sound, which is probably why I noticed something was off. It also seemed like her being was slightly muted, color-wise. It seemed like a soft image, almost normal but slightly faded, like a camera filter. Enough for me to notice something was weird, but not instantly notice what, whilst I was distracted. This was broad daylight, by the way. 
I wasn't seeing things wrong. I even saw her smile a little. I saw her clearly, but it wasn't her. I've got no idea what to do with this. I have no history of hallucinations, etc. I'm not having a mental break, nor am I sleep deprived. Everything else is mostly normal. However, this event did remind me that three or so weeks ago, my 13-year-old was home alone. She heard my toddler giggling in our living room, even though we weren't home. Not many kids live in my building, but a few do, so I brushed it off as her mistaking someone in the hall for my kiddo. Now, I'm not so sure. A couple of years ago, I believe, maybe it was early last year, I was riding in the passenger seat of my car while my boyfriend drove. It was mid-morning, sunny, not a cloud in the sky. Then it appeared. A grid suddenly appeared above my windshield. The best I can describe it is like grid paper you'd use in math class. But all you could see were the multiple lines in black. Besides that, I could still see the sky and the road around it. I even leaned forward in my seat to look up and it went on and on and on for as far as I could see. Like the world was in a grid paper. And just as suddenly as it appeared, it was gone. I'm gonna say it stayed for maybe three to five seconds tops. I asked my boyfriend if he saw it, which he did not. Has anyone else experienced anything like this? I think about it all the time since it happened. Can't explain it. I've glitched twice at work. I run a custom trim shop, Hardwood Lumber Yard. Both glitches involve longtime customers, guys who I know on site. The first time it happened was around 2010. We had a few contractors who did enough business with us that they had accounts. They could just sign for materials rather than the usual payment on delivery model. I'm not saying all contractors are shady, but... There's a lot of the fly-by-night guys who say they'll pay when the job's done, but you never hear from them again. I get that not everyone has the capital to lay out for material, but I've been burned enough times to know the difference between an established business and the cash-on-delivery guys. Anyway, call this customer Mr. C. One day, Mr. C comes in and his left hand is heavily bandaged. Obviously, I ask what happened. Mr. C was cutting a piece of plywood on a table saw by himself. Halfway through, it started to fall off the table. He put his hand down to push it back on top of the table and sliced the top of his middle finger, half of his ring finger, and all of his pinky off. We talked about it and agreed how table saws are the most dangerous tools. I actually know more guys who have been injured by nail guns, but I was being sympathetic. Anyway... I didn't see Mr. C for five or six weeks. I saw he had an order ready to pick up one day, and I made sure I was in the shop. I wanted to say hi and check on how he was holding up after his accident. When I walked up to the loading dock, Mr. C and one of our employees were loading red oak baseboards into his box van. Mr. C was using both hands. Both fully fingered hands. I didn't say anything. I just helped him load the material into the van and made sure the paperwork was in order. After he pulled out, I said something to my employee about how I thought Mr. C had cut his fingers from his left hand. My employee just looked at me weird and said he didn't know what I was talking about. This employee knew Mr. C's accident. He was there the day that Mr. C showed up in bandages. I know that we discussed it and nail guns. No one in the shop knew what I was talking about, so I let it go. Mr. C officially retired a few years ago with all of his fingers. My second glitch actually had a witness. 
July 2018. I was eating lunch in the break room with one of our older employees. We weren't talking, just eating our microwave leftovers, staring at our phones. He grunts and says, Mr. Mr. K K died. I was taken aback and he showed me the obituary. Mr. K had been killed in an automobile accident the previous weekend. Arrangements were scheduled at the local funeral home on Friday. I felt bad that I couldn't go to the calling hours. Mr. K had been a friend of my grandpa's. They were both carpenters. My kid had friends coming over for a sleepover that night, so I wasn't going to cancel it to go to a calling for a guy I didn't really know. My dad was going anyway, so our family was still represented. Fast forward to January 2019. The same employee walks into the office and says that he has a customer that requires assistance. That's our usual code for, here's a Karen that we don't want to deal with. I walk out to the warehouse, and standing there is Mr. K. Longtime employee walks behind Mr. K, looking at me, with his eyebrows raised so high they're disappearing into his ball cap. I was stunned. I greeted him, shook his hand. I asked him how he's been doing. He said he's been fine. We found the couple of boards he needed for his project. He paid and was on his way. As he was pulling out, my employee said, I I swear, swear. I thought thought he was was dead. dead. Amazed that I wasn't the only one this time, I agreed. We talked for a while about how we both remembered the obituary. I went back to the office and called my dad. I asked him if Mr. K was alive. He said he hadn't heard otherwise. Dad didn't remember going to a funeral. I've only talked to my employee about it one other time. We chalked it up to an oddity, but it still weirds me out. I don't know if this counts as a glitch, but I've got no other explanation for this one. Also, when researching my own experience, I found that mine isn't the only one to involve butter. Yeah, that's right. Straight up cow's milk butter. Okay, anyways, here's what happened and when it happened. The year is 2008, New Year's Eve, Jacksonville, Oregon small place west of Medford, Oregon. Present at the time of the event is me, my little sister, and our cat. We're getting ready to make chocolate chip cookies like we do every year on New Year's Eve. And we're waiting for our mom to get home from the store with the noisemakers, sparkling cider, etc. She's taking forever. I tell my sister that mom's going to be home soon. Let's not start yet, blah, blah. She's temporarily very disappointed, then turns and asks if we can watch the Polar Express for the umpteenth time, because she's seven and doesn't know real struggle. I put on the movie and then I go back to the kitchen to grab my charger. It's sometime after five and my mom calls, asking me to make sure the butter is soft enough. If it's not, she'll pick up more and warm it in the car. My mom and her cookies, man... She's serious. The butter has been on the counter since she made me take it out that morning at breakfast. So, all day. I essentially make eye contact with the butter. I touch it, ever so lightly, and I let her know the butter was plenty soft. And then I tell her she'd better hurry home if she wanted to micromanage this whole operation. She pretends to laugh, I laugh for real... I turn around and I walk back to the living room. We hang up. Then I realize with the excitement of making myself laugh, I forgot my charger in the kitchen. I spin around, go to grab the charger and I realize the butter is gone. It's not even possible. I think I must be looking at the wrong counter or something. So I turn and I look all over. I look on every counter. 
and it's just nowhere to be found. Fridge? No. I go to my sister. I check all around her, even though I know it's not even possible, unless she's a ghost or something. Eventually, I look inside of every cupboard, every drawer, every crevice. I even check the trash. My cat was sleeping the entire time in the living room, which is where my sister was. And I was, well, this whole story tells you where I was and what I did. Eventually, I called my mom to tell her to grab butter. At first, she was pretty pissed. Thought I was lying initially. She was a skeptic until she saw me face to face. She saw how relentless I was at trying to find it, and my sister too. We never found the butter. I was doing some work in the garage, and later I left through the garage door. I started walking away from the house, and I felt eyes looking at me. I look back, and I see my sister looking at me through the living room window. We wave at each other, and I keep going on my merry way. Later, I referenced how I could feel her looking at me, and she said, what are you talking about? And I said, when I wave to you, as I was leaving. She had no idea what I was talking about. To make it even more weird, she was apparently at work at the time. This happened a long time ago. I'm glad I get to tell this story now. It's pretty mundane, but weird enough to me that I'll never forget it. My friend and I took a trip to a nearby city and stopped at a gas station to grab something to drink and to use the restroom. He went in first, and while he was in there, I picked out my drink. I noticed pineapple Fanta. I hadn't tried it before, but it sounded interesting, so I decided I'd give it a shot. I know that I didn't just grab the wrong one by mistake. I had to look closely to check the caffeine content of it, as I was trying to limit it at the time. When my friend got out, I handed him my drink and my debit card so that he could get whatever he wanted and to meet me in the car. It's important to mention that I'm fairly certain he would never do this as a prank or a joke. We were really close at the time, but even outside of all that, he was never known to do stuff like that. Messing with people never seemed to impress him much. It was also only the two of us anyway, so it's not like he could get a laugh about it with somebody else. We drive somewhere else and start eating. I reach into the bag and I grab our drinks. And somehow, my pineapple Fanta is now orange Fanta. I said something along the lines of, Was there something wrong with the pineapple one? I know that's what I handed you. He looked at the bottle, and he looked at me, confused, and he said that he knew it was pineapple before, too. He was actually going to ask me how it was, since it was kind of an unusual flavor. It really weirded us out for the rest of the day. I know I wouldn't have grabbed an orange one, even if I decided I wanted orange soda instead. I've always thought that orange Fanta was the worst orange soda, and definitely would have gotten sun-kissed or Fago instead. The only thing we've ever been able to come up with is that the cashier accidentally switched it out. But that asks more questions than it answers. Why would she have one up at the counter? Why would it be nearby enough for her to accidentally grab the wrong one? She clearly wasn't drinking it. It was still sealed and cold. The whole thing reminds me of when a variable in software messes up and it reverts something to the default value. Orange Fanta would certainly be the default Fanta if there was one. Maybe the simulation's code got mixed up in there somewhere.
Okay, so I was at home with my girlfriend at the time and two friends. I was looking out the window and there was fucking quickly changing flashing colors in the sky. And during the day too, I live in Montreal so I don't live where you would be seeing the northern lights. And even if they were the northern lights, these lights looked totally synthetic. It was going between purple, blue, yellow, pink. I was fucking blown away and I was like, what the fuck is going on? I called my girlfriend and friends to come look and they were as confused as me. Years later, I was thinking about it and I brought it up to my friends and they had no memory of it whatsoever. I asked my girlfriend and she remembered it. I have no clue what it could have been. Any ideas? I basically just think it's aliens. I grew up in a very small, rural, yet scenic town. You know, the kind that lays dormant until warm weather brings cottagers and tourists. The summer I was 18, I was involved with a guy, we'll call him Jack, who had a lake house nearby. I'm 22 now, and I haven't seen him since. The summer that I was 20, I lived and worked in the city I'd moved to for college. I avoided my hometown, which was three hours away by car, at the time, only going back briefly that year for Christmas. But one day, I got a random text from Jack. Hey, it was great catching up with you today. I'd love to hang out sometime, like you suggested. Smiley face. When did you say you were off? It took a while to explain to him that I hadn't spent more than 72 consecutive hours in that town in almost a year. Apparently, I had called his name back when he called mine from across the street. We talked about the old days, and I'd given him a brief life update. And what I had said about what I was up to these days included some information that he had no way of knowing. For the record... This wasn't the only time someone claimed to have seen me in my hometown while I was gone. It's just the most memorable. I was house sitting for a coworker when I experienced the strangest thing. My coworker told me that I could help myself to anything while she was away. She said that she would prefer it actually so she didn't have to throw away perfectly good food when she got back. The first night there I decided to make tacos. Little for me, little for her little pupper's Milo. I took note of the things that she had in her fridge and I started planning meals for the next three days. As for beverages, not a lot of options outside of some wine and milk, which I don't drink either. So I made note to go to the store and grab some almond milk, some juice, in the morning. The next day, after my shift, I headed to the store and I grabbed the goods. I went back to her place, fed the pup, and then I opened the fridge to put the drinks away. When I did, I was shocked to see the exact items I bought were already in the fridge. I looked back at the counter, and there they were, sitting on the counter. I looked back at the fridge, and there they also were. I wanted to, like, document this somehow, but I realized there's just no way to convey the strangeness with a photo or a video. It just looks like groceries. But to be in my body at that moment... To see what I saw, I was shook. I casually asked my coworker if she by chance drinks pog juice or silk brand almond milk. Her answer, no, but there's a two liter of Diet Coke in the cupboard if you're thirsty. Not exactly what I was looking for, 
I guess the worst thing to come out of all of this is I have two of the things I love. But what the actual hell happened here? I never knew what a doppelganger was until someone that I was friends with tried to tell me that Lindsay Lohan was her official doppelganger. Even then, I thought it was like a trend, just a weird name that people were giving lookalikes. Didn't think it was scary, didn't think much of it, honestly. Until I was about 22, so just under 10 years ago, I just moved out of my parents' house the year before and had been living with two friends in the downtown Seattle area, close to where we were all raised. This area was busy, busy during the summertime. It's like when the sun comes out in Seattle, people finally leave their homes all at once, and they just stay there, crowding up the streets with their seasonal joy, myself included. My friends and I had been drinking and eating most of the day at the Ballard Seafood Festival, When festivals like these happen, oftentimes they close off one or two relatively main streets to cars, and they open them up to pedestrians. At each end of the streets, you can find portable bathrooms, the porta-potties. We'd made our way to the far end and decided that before circling back, we'd use the restrooms. On our way to do so, I see a friend working one of the vendor booths, so I stop to chat for a minute. My other two friends continue to the bathrooms. After saying goodbye to my friend, I too head that way. But, and I don't know how else to say this, but I felt suddenly like someone was going to hurt me. At the very least, someone was intently watching me. Surrounded by probably hundreds of people, I realize no one's looking at me. So, what is this feeling? But then, straight ahead, an almost perfect view from an almost perfect separation of the crowd, I see myself. I'm standing in front of me, and I have no idea what the fuck is going on. My shorts, my shirt, my fucking face. Looking at this person, me. It's making me physically ill, but I can't look away. I do the weirdest thing I've ever done in public, maybe, and I just stand there and close my eyes. I'm hoping that they're gone when I open them. They are. They're gone. I stumble over to a large tree. It's off to the side of the bathrooms. I lean against the tree, and I try to catch my breath. Because for some reason, I'm out of breath. But I'm filled with that feeling again. It's like dread or something. It's telling me to move. Not with words exactly, but I know somehow I should move. And the moment that I do, a motorcycle comes flying through the pedestrian barricade and slams into the exact tree I was just leaning against. Plastic shards rip off the bike and onto the street, into the air. I feel bits bounce off of my arms as I shield my face. Standing there in shock, I realize this guy needs help, but I can't bring myself to move. I watch as several people grab the man and his bike. People are grabbing me, asking if I'm okay, but I can't speak. I hear two familiar voices, and it's my friends. They are freaking out, asking me what the hell happened. They get the story from the people around me. I'm just watching these people help this guy on the ground, and all I can think is, he's alive. That's good. I slowly start to walk away, and my friends follow, asking me things I can't answer or even comprehend. I make my way to the bathroom. I still have to pee. They stop with their accident questions and switch gears. Wait, 
why are you going to the bathrooms? Didn't you literally just do that? No, I say. The accident, remember? Well, yeah, but you came out of the bathrooms, right as Kelly did? No, I didn't. That's how we knew that you'd be over here, remember? No, I don't. You told us to meet you by the big tree next to the comic book store. So, it wasn't just me that saw me. Everyone saw me. My friends, they talked to me. Probably the worst thing to come out of this is that it showed me that my friends kind of suck. They didn't believe that it wasn't me that they talked to. And as much as I get that, it also hurt a lot of the time. Kind of still does, to be honest. Best thing to come out of it? Either my doppelganger was trying to kill me and failed, or somehow they were trying to save my life. And I'm okay not knowing which one it truly was. Years ago, I was working nights as a phlebotomist, person who draws your blood, in a hospital. There was this doctor who was notorious for ordering reoccurrent tests incorrectly. He would order a single draw when he really needed a serial draw 90% of the time. But because one in ten times he really wanted a single draw, you always had to check with him. This night happened to be the end of daylight savings, so at 1.59 a.m., the clocks would turn to 3 a.m. instead of 2. At about 1.30, I get an order on my screen from this doctor. I was the only phleb on nights, and I worked with two techs. I signed and showed them, Look, Dr. X ordered this test again. I'll see if he's on the floor and if he really wants this or a serial draw. I went up to that floor and he was at the nurse's station. I remember it so clearly because he was wearing plaid black and yellow skinny pants under his white coat. I couldn't stand the guy and I thought his loud ugly pants just drew attention to his loud ugly personality. I walked up to him and said, hey I just got this order for XYZ patient. Did you mean to order the three serial draws? He was dismissive and said something like, Of course I did. Can you just draw three? I, of course, cannot just poke a patient three different times without orders. So I asked him if he could reorder it and I'd go back to the lab to print the stickers and come right back to do the first draw. I drew a couple of patients quickly, knowing he'd take a few minutes to get the order in. I rode the elevator back to the lab and checked my computer. It was 1.58, and the orders were there, so I printed them and stuck my specimens in the centrifuge while they printed. I pulled the labels off the printer and looked closely and realized he had ordered the single draw again. I pulled up the order code, wrote it down for him, and went back to the floor to just ask him to order this exactly. When I got to the floor, he was standing exactly where he was when I had come up the first time, wearing plain black pants. I assumed some bodily fluid had forced him to change, and I knew he was going to be really annoyed when I asked him to reorder the labs. By now, it was definitely past 1.59, so the clocks were reading three-something. I asked him if he could reorder the test. He was totally pleasant and not at all frustrated that I was asking him. I asked him if room 208 had thrown up on him or something, and if that's why he had to change. He then seemed offended and was like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, sorry to offend. When I came up earlier, you had on yellow pants, so I assumed something happened. 
He scoffed at me and said, I've been wearing these all night. I don't own yellow pants. You must be confused. I'm thinking that he's being weird and should just admit that he got puked on, but whatever. Go back to the lab, print the orders, and finally draw the patient. I stop to talk to one of the nurses for a moment on my way back down, and she says something like, I saw you talking to Dr. X. He's being weird tonight, right? And she seemed kind of shaken. I said, yeah, he was wearing those hideous pants and then tried to pretend that he wasn't. She told me he walked into a room on one side of the wing wearing the yellow pants right before the time change and then walked out seconds later from the other side of the wing wearing black. I was weirded out. I went back down to the lab where the techs asked me where the samples were for the patients I'd drawn after asking Dr. X to reorder. I opened the centrifuge that I'd left them in, and they weren't in there. The orders showed that the labels had never been printed, and when I apologetically went to redraw the patients, they had no idea who I was, and they didn't have cotton and tape on their arm from when I'd drawn them earlier. I still have absolutely no explanation for this. It appears that everything between first receiving the incorrect order and returning to ask him to reorder for the second time never happened. The text didn't remember me showing them that he had ordered incorrectly the first time or anything. The only reason I didn't check into a psychiatric facility was the nurse who corroborated my story. We hardly knew each other at the time, but we like trauma bonded over the experience and we've talked about it so many times. The weirdest part to me is that it coincided with daylight savings ending. That is completely a social construct. Nothing actually happens when we move the clock, so what the heck? I still get chills when I think about it or talk about it. And because people always question why I was so tuned in with the clocks and know exactly when things happened, I was a worker whose shift was an hour shorter that night. We all kind of watch the clock and do a mini celebration when it changes. When I was about 8 to 10 years old, I lived in a fucking horrifying apartment complex. So I'll tell one of my supernatural, paranormal stories that really freaked me out. So I'd just gotten to bed, and I made sure my curtains were closed all the way, because I was terrified of being able to look out my windows while laying down. I always had a hard time going to sleep, but that night was different. I fell asleep easily. I fell asleep easily, but I woke up in the middle of the night, I think. I remember I couldn't check the time because of how scared I was. When I woke, I kind of squirmed around and then finally opened my eyes. I noticed it was really dark. Soon enough, my eyes adjusted to the dark, and that's when I noticed something. By my closet was someone sitting down and staring at me. But it wasn't a stranger. I fucking knew this person. It was my mom. But at the same time, it wasn't my mom. Because for one, my mom wouldn't be in my room, staring at me while I was sleeping and sitting on my bedroom floor. Also, it looked like my mom, but its eyes were off. My mom has the most vibrant, pretty blue eyes. It had eyes that were darker, not too dark, but you could tell the difference. And it was looking at me like someone would if they were spaced out. It also had the most emotionless expression that my mom would never wear on her face. It scared the crap out of me. 
I kind of shifted over and looked towards my window where it wasn't at, and so it couldn't see my face. I noticed my curtains were opened a bit, where I could see outside, which also scared me. So I closed my eyes, trying to go back to sleep. Surprisingly, I fell asleep in almost an instant. When I woke up, no one was there. I didn't tell anyone about it until weeks later, and I told my mom during laundry when I noticed a shirt. It was the shirt that the thing was wearing. My mom kind of freaked out, and she told me to tell her stuff sooner. What you know will forever change on New Year's Day. This is not a warning, but a guarantee of what is to happen. My five-year-old son told me this while I was buckling him into his car seat this morning. He spends the weekends with his father, and let's just say he's not the most responsible parent on the planet. Let's call him Adam. So after buckling my son up, snug and secure... I walked back into the house to calmly ask Adam why my baby angel is quoting end-of-the-world cautionaries in the backseat of my car right now. I was seriously about ready to call our mediator, but Adam promised me that he doesn't know where our son picked it up from. Adam's girlfriend, who we'll call Tina, steps onto the porch and says, I swear, I wouldn't let that happen little man started saying it at breakfast. Tina also said that she walked into his room this morning to wake him up, but he was already awake, standing in the dark. When she turned on the light, he bent his head and gave her a really weird, side-eyed glare. Calling his name surrendered, no reply. Apparently, it wasn't until she clapped her hands in front of his face when he snapped out of it. He then gave her the same message of impending doom, verbatim. And yeah, how could such precise choosing of words by a five-year-old not get burned into your memory? Tina then asks my son, what will change? Our time here, he answers. Tina says, here's the kicker. I say, who told you this? And he says, past mommy. Naturally, Tina thought he was talking about me, so out of respect, she dropped it. Some people tell their kids crazy things to behave. So with that, I reassure Tina that I'm not an apocalypse conspiracy theorist, and I head back to the car. During our drive home, I decided to inquire more about who this past mommy is. He says that she was the mom before me. I'm like, what? So by the end of our car ride home, in his broken five-year-old English, I'm told about how he and his family were taking pictures on a mountain when it blew up. He casually wraps up the story by saying, we all got hurt. Yikes, right? Well, oddly enough, I used to read a lot about reincarnation, and what he was saying sounded an awful lot like he was talking about a past life. I know it's not totally uncommon for kids to experience memories like this in adolescence. That part of the story oddly didn't unsettle me, but past mommy sticking around, that's a little bit too much. I go, how much do you see past mommy? All the time, he says. Okay, and what did she tell you today? What you know will forever change on New Year's Day. This is not a warning, but a guarantee of what is to happen. And what does that mean, I ask. He just shrugs and says, I don't know. So... 
I just don't really know. What do I do about this? It's a whole lot to unpack, and I'm still trying to get him to learn the alphabet. I wanted to throw this story out there because, secretly, his foreboding sentence has given me extreme paranoia. Like, maybe past mommy is relaying a message through my son to me. And maybe it's supposed to give me this paranoia to the point of bringing me here. Maybe to reach someone else out there. Again, yikes, right? I'm sure I'll feel better when it's 2022. For anyone that does find this, please be safe this New Year's and be careful. If you've been waiting on confirmation for a sign, this is it. Follow the signs. This just happened to me today. I needed a watch for work and I looked at the usual spot where I keep it. Nothing. Then I went searching the area and I couldn't find it. On my way out, I grabbed a jacket I haven't worn since last year. On a whim, I searched the pockets, turning them inside out and nothing. About an hour ago, I heard a beep. I decided to check my pocket. I found my watch. No idea how it got there. It doesn't have a hole in it it could have fallen in. Years ago, I lost a buck in the car. After searching, I couldn't find my buck, but I found a 20 instead. I never lost a 20. Never found that buck. When I was 10 or so, I was visiting a small town in Montana called Whitefish. There wasn't much to do at the time, so my mom tasked me with locating a bookstore so I could do something to occupy myself. I googled and found a Borders in the neighboring town of Cowsbell. I decided to call the number listed just to make sure that they were open. A man answered the phone and confirmed the location. He then gave me basic directions on how to get there. It was located next to a large strip mall with a target and stuff. When my mom and I arrived, there was no borders. It was completely closed, empty, and shut down. In fact, there were signs on the window of the store that it was going to become. When I called the number back, there was an error tone, and a robotic voice said that The number was disconnected. I'll never forget that. I don't know what the heck happened or if it was a ghost or what. Maybe it was just someone with an old boarder's phone number playing a prank, but it will always make my skin crawl. There's no explanation for what happened to me three years ago. I finally accepted that glitches are real, and this one is mine. I left home around 23 to move in with some friends a few towns over. I wasn't too far from home, maybe an hour, so I'd go back pretty regularly. There's never a time that I'd spent more than a couple of weeks away from home without at least driving to do dinner with my parents at their house. Near my parents, there are several gas stations. A 76, a Chevron, and an AMPM. My go-to store was always the 76 station. It was a bit hidden compared to the others, less busy, with the best candy selection, and somehow, the cheapest cigarettes. So three years ago, even though I had just been to see my parents a week prior, they told me I basically had to come home for my sister's graduation party. 
I made one of my roommates come with me since he wanted to check out my hometown anyways. Or maybe he just wanted to check out my sister. Either way, he was a carpool buddy. Naturally, as we get closer to my parents, I tell them that we're going to stop off at the 76 and grab some munchies and anything else. As I turn down the road toward the 76, I realize it's not there. At least the large sign wasn't showing from this distance like it normally does. We drive a bit further and still nothing. We get there officially and like nothing is there. I mean, something's there, but it's not the 76. I tell my friend to get out ways and look up 76. Part of me was willing to accept I took a wrong turn, but most of me knew that literally wasn't possible. He tells me what I already know. This is where the map says 76 is. Or where it's supposed to be. My friend says they probably closed it down. Literally in a week. Two weeks max. And with no remnants of a 76 at all. The building wasn't even remotely the same. And all it said on it was bank. Like, what the fuck? I loop around the block a few times. Everything is exactly where it should be. But no matter how many times I pass the 76, it's still just bank. My friend is starting to think I'm insane, telling me to give up already. So I do. Well, we still needed a snack, so we head to the AMPM, and then to my parents. We'd been there for a while, yakking it up with family, friends, etc. Eventually, my friend comes up while I'm talking to my dad and sister, and he's laughing, saying something about how I was in such distress when the gas station disappeared. I interrupted him a bit and direct a question to my dad and sister. When did they completely demolish and rebuild where the 76 used to be? They both look at me like I'm crazy, and my friend says, see, he just can't let it go. My dad laughs, my sister too, both ready to inform us that we're wrong, that the 76 is still there. In fact, my sister still goes there all the time. This sort of argument ensues back and forth until finally I tell my sister that we're going to hop in the car and she's going to come with us and I'm going to prove her wrong. So that's what we did. I mean, we hopped in the car. My friend put 76 into ways and we started the journey. Except this time, when we turned, I saw the sign immediately. And then there was the gas station, like it had never left. It wasn't a strange building that said bank anymore. I look at my friend and he's on my page. My sister's laughing, like, how the fuck did you miss this? I drive around the block and then a bunch of other blocks too. The 76 never moves and bank never shows back up. My sister didn't even entertain my claims, only budging slightly when my friend kept vouching for me. This whole no way thing went on forever, but in the end, it was the same. Nothing changed. I would appear to look crazy to everyone, except my friend. It's left me feeling like I just don't always trust the world we live in, I guess. I just have no clue, but... Three years later, this shit still blows my mind. The craziest thing that's personally been experienced or witnessed by me was New Year's Eve 2004. I was 15 and it was just me and my grandma Lo, who's no longer with us. We were at the house. She's bedridden at this time, but still lucid. Around 10 p.m., I turn all of our TVs to the Dick Clark's New Year's Rockin' Eve special. After turning my grandma's TV to the station, she wished me a happy New Year, saying she wasn't sure she'd be able to keep her eyes open much longer. I knew she was a bit disappointed that year because Regis Feldman was going to be stepping in for Dick Clark due to his stroke. I wished her a happy new year, and then I retreated to the living room where Dick Clark was also playing. 
Both of my parents were at a friend's New Year's Eve party. So, I was at home mainly by choice, but also just in case of an emergency. I could dial 911 for my grandma, or she could dial it for me using her 911 emergency button, which was attached to her bed. Another button on her bed, the left-hand side, activated what I called her little call bell. This button was attached to wires, which connected at the ceiling of the home, and bells were attached to the wires, so that if she pressed the button, it would alert someone, regardless what room of the home they were in. Also, this button, it wasn't one that she could accidentally bump due to its positioning off to the side. Later that night, I was still in the living room, reading, with the New Year's Eve special playing in the background, when my grandma rang her little call bell. I looked at the TV, and I noticed it was already 11.56, so almost a couple of hours since I was last in her room. I could see that the countdown on the TV was in full effect, and we were only four minutes away from the big finale. As I walked down the small hallway from the living room to her room, I had the weirdest sensation, almost like the strongest sense of deja vu you could have, but nothing actually seemed familiar yet. I heard my grandma say, I made it. Get in here. It sounded like her, absolutely, but she sounded almost too far away. Slightly confused why she sounded like that, I picked up the pace. But as I rounded the corner, my grandma was laying in bed, and she didn't look like she was awake. Her TV was on, but it seemed like the time was off, since the countdown still showed over an hour. Maybe she changed the channel, and it's replaying on some other station. At least that's what I thought as I walked over to her saying, Grandma? But it was clear she had somehow already dozed off. I leaned over. She was definitely breathing. I thought to myself, Wow, she fell back asleep super quick. Even though it all felt a bit strange, I wasn't sure what to make of it, so I then retreated back to the living room. I sat down on the couch and started to feel strange. Sort of like I had in the hallway just moments before I was back on the couch. I thought, why does it feel like I've been here before? I looked for the remote, expecting it to be where I had last placed it, on the arm of the couch. But instead, it was in this weird position on the coffee table, where I had balanced it on a coaster to spin it around almost an hour ago. Weird. But I just told myself I need to go to bed or something. I looked at the TV. The time was wrong on this one, too. It showed that there was over an hour before midnight and that it was 10.56. Regis Feldman was on the screen again, rambling about the noisy, rowdy crowds, which he'd also done an hour ago. I grabbed the remote from the coaster, and I went through the channels and the TV guide. It was still showing 10.56. I went to the kitchen, and the clocks showed 10.56, and then 10.57. But nothing was showing me 11.56, as it just had. All of the clocks were showing the same time, and I had no idea what the heck was going on. The next hour, I spent intently watching the special. Not like I had before, but really watching it, not reading my book. Feldman was either repeating himself, or I was hearing the same things I had been hearing for an hour. Ashley Simpson. Maybe she'd performed twice since she was all over the show anyways. But the same song? The same performance? No. I try to prove myself wrong, but then, eventually, the real 1156 hits. And I just know that my grandma's little call bell is going to go off. 
So I stand up and I start walking towards my grandma's room. I freeze in the hallway and I have the same feeling, but this time I know what's familiar. I know what she's going to say. And then she does. I made it. Get in here. Only when she says it now, it sounds right. It sounds like she's just inside the room, not far away as it did earlier. I round the corner, but this time she's sitting up in bed, excited to see me and waving me over. I look at her TV, and it's got the right time on it now, 11.56, just four minutes till midnight. I calmly ask my grandma, do you remember calling me in here earlier, saying the same thing? She told me no. She thought she'd fallen asleep almost the moment I left her room earlier, which was when I put the special on her TV hours ago. I didn't bother elaborating on what had happened as to not confuse her. But I was definitely internally freaking out. We watched the ball drop, and shortly after, my grandma fell asleep. I wasn't feeling so tired. Instead, I waited for my parents to get home. And once they were in bed, I felt like I could finally fall asleep. To this day, I'm still not sure what happened. Did I have a weird psychic experience? Or was this some weird glitch? Anyone else experience anything strange on December 31st, 2004? Because this absolutely happened to me, but it never did happen again. A few years ago, I was with my partner at the time, and we were on the freeway, heading home, with her at the wheel. We made that commute every single day, and she knew it like the back of her hand, as the house was originally her parents' house that she'd grown up in. We were in our early 20s and moved in when they moved to a different state. It was so routine to the point of getting off on our exit out of habit even if we needed to get off on a different one further up ahead. We were both just listening to the music, and I happened to make note of the time, and I looked up to see some landmark buildings and the shopping center that appear right before our exit, which meant that we were almost home. I can't explain it, but for a moment it just felt like I spaced out unprovoked really bad for what seemed to last only a second. And when I came to... We were a mile past our exit. For some reason, my ex and I both turned and looked at each other immediately in disbelief. We had both experienced it at the same time, and we were extremely confused as to why we were a mile past our exit when we were literally approaching the off-ramp. I'm talking like not even a half a mile away. And then I said... We just missed our exit, but how does that make any sense? We were right there. And she said something along the lines of, I know, I was getting ready to get onto the off-ramp lane when what the hell just happened? I looked at the clock again and it was still the same time. Usually it takes two minutes to get to the following exit, so it's not like we had both managed to space out and miss the exit to the point of, approaching the next one. Time-wise, it should have been two minutes past what I saw, right before our exit, but it was the same. We couldn't get over it the whole night. We talked for hours about what could have happened, but ultimately settled on a glitch. To this day, I remember that moment vividly. Very strange. A 
before I get into my story, please note that I do not, have not, and will not get into drugs or narcotics. And that what I'm saying is the absolute truth. As fake as it may sound, please, listen. I was taking a course that required me to be there in person. The course took place at a school that was a 40 to 45 minute walk, depending on your pace. For the most part, though, my dreadful coordination has led me to getting lifts from my mother each morning to school. From school, however, I'd have to walk home as she finishes at a later hour. I still remember feeling nervous about walking home alone. I'd never done it before. As I'm a dependent person, relying heavily on other people to help guide me through life, it's something I'm working on, and I knew this would be a step in the right direction, even if it wasn't by choice. The first few times were smooth sailing. It's a fairly simple path, despite being a long walk, by my standards at least. I don't get out much. But I felt comfortable with the process, nonetheless until this one particular day, after the class ended. I, of course, started to walk home once the class concluded, alone, and started feeling odd. I'm not sure how else one would describe the feeling of being watched other than creeped out. Like, not just a simple glance over. It felt like someone was actively observing every step I took. But that's when my focus drifted back to the person walking ahead of me. They weren't directly in front of me. I'm not good with estimates, so if I had to guess, I'd say 14 meters away. Enough for me to make out their features. I didn't notice this before, as I tend to shy away from looking at people. But I realized that this person has all too familiar features. Their hair, clothing bag. Hell, even their odd gait matched my own. And, and their pinky finger. In a previous year, I punched a brick wall which left my pinky finger disformed. That girl had the exact same thing on the exact same hand. It's not a coincidence. I didn't know what to do other than act like nothing was wrong, but at the same time, I couldn't look away from her. I was freaking out on the inside. I watched her, trying to see if perhaps I could catch a glimpse of her face and get the confirmation I wanted, that this really is just a coincidence, and I'm overthinking this whole thing. I couldn't tell if she started catching on that someone was watching her, but she would not stop walking down the same roads, going in the direction of my home, looking exactly like me. She just walked around the freaking corner and then poof, gone. I felt even more freaked out. I don't know what to think. Am I going crazy? Did I imagine the whole experience? I don't want to walk home again. I need help. This happened to me originally when I was in the third grade, back in 1999. I'd been playing in my backyard when a neighbor asked me if I could come to the park to play Foursquare with some other kids. My dad was right there in the backyard with me, and he gave me the okay. So I ran inside to head out the front door. I was so excited and such a third grader that it took me a minute to realize I didn't have any shoes on. Since part of the walk was through gravel, painful gravel, I decided to run back and grab them. I turned back, and once I got to the front door, I realized it was locked. I could hear the lawnmower going in the back, but I was too short to open the side fence to the back. So instead, I started to hit the doorbell and knock slightly obnoxiously, knowing that there were other people home. After a couple of rings and knocks, I turned around to see how far my friends had gotten, but was immediately distracted by someone that looked out of place. 
directly across the street, someone in a long gray coat, black pants, and white shoes. Their face wasn't entirely visible due to them having a hood on, and they had their head tilted down a bit. For a moment, I thought, maybe that's my dad. Same height, maybe he even had a coat like that. Something seemed so familiar about this person. But it couldn't be my dad. I'd just seen him. And besides, he was mowing the lawn. I raised my arm to wave at the person, even though I had a feeling they wouldn't respond. And they didn't. They just stood there, looking down but forward, and most of their face still obscured by the shadow of their hood. Then, for another one of those split seconds, I thought I might walk over to this person, talk to them. Only just as quickly I realized or felt that that was off limits somehow. Suddenly I heard my front door open. It sort of snapped me out of the daze and I turned around real fast. Did you forget something? My mom asked. There again I needed a moment. Then I quickly turned back around to point out the man to my mom. I'm asking who he is, only to realize that he's not standing there anymore. My mom asks me what I've said, but I don't repeat it. I just walk inside and grab my shoes. I went to play Foursquare, and I told my friends about the strange man, and that was it. Until about ten years later. Christmas at my parents' house. Time to open presents. I received the staple items. Socks, underwear, shaving stuff. And my bigger gift is this very nice gray pea coat. Super warm. Exactly what I was looking for since I now lived in Seattle, a much colder place than California. Eventually, my cousins say that we need to go outside and take our annual family photo in front of the tree in my parents' front yard. It's a giant evergreen, and they decorate it every Christmas. I take this opportunity to head out early and smoke a quick cig, grabbing my coat and putting it on on the way out. I shuffle across the street, and before I start smoking, I grab my phone to see if my girlfriend called me back. She hadn't, but I started getting lost on my phone for a minute. Then I had the craziest sense of deja vu. And then I see a flash. I look up, and it's my cousin, taking a picture of me from across the street, telling me to put out the cancer stick and get ready for the picture. I toss the smoke and shuffle back over to my parents' side of the road, as I'm approaching, my cousin asks if I can help set up the tripod. I agree, and then she says, Oh yeah, try not to look like a creeper in this one, okay? Then she sort of laughs and waits for me to react. The same time, she's showing me a picture that she just took of me. Instantly, I was transported back to 1999, at least in my mind. I have no explanation for what I saw, I just know what I saw. The picture was me, but it was also the man that I'd seen across the street over ten years ago. It was someone in a long gray coat, black pants, and white shoes, their face slightly obscured by their hood, facing forward and looking down. Still gives me chills. I can't figure out if it's a form of time travel, glitch in the matrix, or... Truly the most insane coincidence of all time. Back in 1998, I took a road trip with a good friend at the time from our hometown in Springer, New Mexico. Our destination was Las Vegas for a New Year's Eve party. The drive was a good 11, 12 hours, and it was one that we'd never done before, at least not alone. We left early on the morning of the 30th, knowing that we could make it to Vegas by that night if we just drove the whole way through. On the way out of town, we stopped to grab some snacks, some gas, some water, 
And then we thought, what the heck, let's buy ourselves a map too. It was about 20 minutes or so of driving that my friend suggested I pull out the map and get a sense of the best route. We already had our eye on I-40, but there was the possibility of staying on I-25 the whole way through. We decided we'd figure it out once we got to Santa Fe. I ended up dozing off for a bit, and I had a weird dream that I was in the car like I was, but we were driving in the opposite direction, back towards home. My friend woke me up and we were sitting outside of a gas station. The cross street read, Old Las Vegas Highway. So I knew we'd made it to Santa Fe or possibly further. While my friend went inside, I stayed in the car and decided to examine the map some more. Growing up in New Mexico, we learn a lot about Native American culture in school. It's also a huge part of the culture in general, especially as you travel inland toward the Apache and Navajo Indian reservations. We wanted to go this way on the way out of town for shopping, to visit the trading posts, and to visit St. Michael's. St. Michael's was known for having a lot of shops and a neat tourism center. So the map essentially shows me that we'll be going through both of these reservations, or at least one of them depending which way we take. All I can think about is how cool it's going to be. My friend gets back to the car, and I tell her, let's take I-40 and go to St. Michael's. So we agree, I-40 to St. Michael's. We make it as far as Bernalillo before I have to pee. My friend pulls off to what appears to be the only building in town which happens to be a gas station with a bathroom sign visible from the outside. I rush to the outside door and it's locked. Either someone's in there or it requires a key, so I go inside the place. It's ice cold in there and I can't figure out why, but I see the clerk and I ask to use the key to the bathroom. He tells me there isn't one. Okay. I go outside and I wait for the bathroom, It's a painful wait, but it's eventually over. I use the disgusting bathroom, and when I get back to the car, I see my friend standing on the other side of the parking lot, just staring off into the distance. I start to make my way over to her when suddenly I trip. Not a huge fall, but enough to knock me off balance a bit and take my eyes off my friend. I look back up, and she's gone. But then I hear her, From behind me, I hear, Hey, you good to go? Let's hit the road. We're burning daylight. She was walking out of the gas station in the opposite direction of where I just saw her with more snacks. We get on the road and I can't stop thinking about what I saw. I would forget about it or try to, and then it would just creep back into my mind. I was about to say something, just to get it in someone else's mind, when I realized we weren't on I-40. I grabbed the map and I asked my friend, where are we? Somehow she ended up on an entirely different road, but it looked like we were still en route to St. Michael's, somehow, which was good. It definitely looked like it was going to add some time, though, so I let her know and we agreed to just move forward. After about an hour on the road, we needed gas. It became clear that we were basically driving through a lot of nothingness, so we hoped gas was close. Just before we thought we might run out of gas, we reached a town called Farmington. My friend got gas and I talked to the clerk, asking him to give it to me straight. What's the best and fastest way to St. Michael's? He basically draws a straight line down on the map from where we are, and he says that's the way that we need to go, but that we shouldn't, that the timing isn't right. I ask him to elaborate, he doesn't. So I'm uncomfortable with the advice, but I decide to go tell my friend anyways and see what she thinks. When I walk out to the car, I notice she's no longer pumping gas, so 
I hop in the car. I start to tell her about our options and the creepy message from the clerk. But I notice that my friend is shocked to see me, almost scared. So I ask her, what's up? I don't think we should go to Vegas anymore. I ask her, why? She has a hard time saying it, but eventually she does. Because we just told us not to? I wasn't entirely sure what she meant by that. I hadn't even gotten as far as telling her about the clerk. So I asked her, What do you mean? She told me that while she was pumping gas, she was facing the road, not the store. She said she swore she saw someone, maybe two yards away, that looked to be wearing my exact outfit. And in that same moment, she heard my voice, and then her voice, from the other side of the car. I don't think we should go to Vegas. Yeah, we need to turn around. She turned around to face that direction. I was inside the store, still talking to the clerk. Before we left the gas station, I confessed what I saw in Bernalillo and what the clerk had just told me. We both were filled with dread, had goosebumps everywhere. We were almost too scared to even make our way home. We knew we'd be driving through nothingness, and likely in the dark at some point. But we knew more than anything, we shouldn't go to Vegas. After much debate, a lot of silence, and a creepy look or two from the clerk, we hit the road. We followed our advice, the clerk's advice, and we turned around. Driving home, we were on a mission, and we basically made it home on New Year's Eve. Two days later, we read about a motel fire. It was at the motel that we were meant to stay at that night. Two people were killed. I'm not saying that we could have been killed, but over 30 people were injured in that fire, so there's a good chance that we could have at least been one of those. I'm not sure what you'd call an event like this, but it's never left my mind, and I still have yet to go to Vegas for some reason. So I have a bunch of the same guitar pick. Same size, brand, shape, and thickness, but some are red and some are black. I was playing and I put my pick down right beside me on the couch. I look away for a second. I look back and it disappeared. I figured, you know, things fall into the couch and whatnot. I get up and I grab another, this time a black one. I play for a while, and I again put the pick down in the same place. I look away, and this one disappears too. I think, God damn it, these picks really do disappear like crazy. A common trope amongst guitarists. I say, fuck it, and I go do something else for a while. I come back to my guitar, and right in the same spot is my original red pick. So confusing. Two picks disappear, and the original pick rematerialized. I still have no explanation for this experience. My girlfriend saw my doppelganger, and it scared the hell out of her. I'll try to give as much detail as possible and keep this from going on for too long. 
This happened back in the summer of 2015 when I was serving in the United States Army Reserves. I was stationed in southern Alabama in a transportation company. Sometimes, my girlfriend would come with me on drill weekends, and we would crash at a friend of hers' apartment, which is where this incident took place. This particular weekend, we were in a large convoy in the middle of nowhere, on some back road out in the sticks over a hundred miles from the city. That was when I got the most confusing, bizarre, and downright creepy phone call of my young life. She was in utter hysterics. She was crying and screaming, wondering why I would frighten her so badly, what the fuck my problem was, and asking me how I even pulled it off. After I was finally able to calm her down, this is the story she relayed to me. Sometime that afternoon, her friend was at work, and she was at the apartment by herself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang on the door. Not a knock. Several loud, violent bangs. After looking through the people, she saw me. But there was something off. She says I was wearing my army uniform. It looked like me, but that I had this very angry, aggravated look on my face. She opened the door, wondering why I was home so early, and apparently without saying a word, I angrily blew past her, shoulder-checking her into the wall, and quickly walked down the hall, taking a left into the bedroom, slamming the door behind me so hard the whole place shook. She was very alarmed and confused about why I was home so early and in such an agitated state. I mean, that is so out of character for me. I'm not a violent guy at all. On top of that, if something did happen to set me off, she would have been the first to hear about it. So, she's walking behind me, trying to get some information out of me, and she opens the bedroom door and sees the closet door slam shut. She proceeds to run over to see what I'm doing in her friend's closet and claims that when she opened the door, it was completely empty. That was when she had a panic attack and called me. Imagine my shock and confusion hearing that story, knowing that I was well over a hundred miles away at the time. She finally believed me after I sent her a photo of my current GPS location, which only served to freak her out more. I thought that there must be some kind of rational explanation for what she saw. I'll be honest and say she smoked a little weed here and there. But at the time, I know she was sober. She didn't mess around with hard drugs or drink, and she didn't have any mental illness of any kind. Over the years since that happened, I came to learn about doppelgangers. I don't really know what they mean, what they represent, or why they come around. All I know is that they are creepy as shit. And a girl I dated for several years came face to face with mine. And it put the fear of God into the poor girl. Take from this story what you will. And honestly, I don't care if anyone believes it or not. I just have to get it off my chest. I have four cats. We just got a new kitten a week ago. He was a stray and is still adjusting to living inside. I tell you that because he's like still sneaking around, mostly staying in the basement where the food and litter boxes are. He's terrified of my dogs, they ignore him, and he's come to the top of the basement stairs for a treat with coaxing. So last night, I'm getting settled in bed, TV and bathroom light on in my room. My other cat, still a kitten, about seven months old, and larger than the new kitten, comes into my bed like she does every night. My husband and I both greet her and say, Oh, it's really time for bed. Stars is ready for her tuck-in. Well, I'm petting my plump calico kitten, and the TV show gets really bright, and I look down, and it's freaking Void, our new black kitten. I sit up and say... It's void in our bed, not stars. 
and my husband turned the light on because he doesn't believe me. Even he's shocked, because stars is calico, and void is solid black. And we both saw stars come into the room, like she does every single night. So Void had braved two sets of stairs, his fear of the dogs, who are also in the bed, and is just chilling on my lap. And I get this weird sensation because Stars is chunky and Void is much smaller and skinny, and all of a sudden, he feels like nothing in my lap, or I just felt the full weight of my chunky girl. So a few minutes later, here comes Stars again, to get tucked in between us. We look at one another and say, Weird. Void tears out of our room like I dragged him up there, and Stars gets on my lap. Cats are a glitch, man. So this happened a couple of days ago. I was sitting in the kitchen, quietly drawing, when I heard the door in the garage open and close. I got up to see if my dad had gotten home, but when I checked, the door was still locked, and it showed no signs of ever being moved. I was, of course, confused at this, but I chalked it up to the fact that I was home alone, in a quiet house, so I'm bound to hear something. A few minutes later, however, I see my dad walk down the hallway. I got up to tell him that he scared me with the whole locking the door again thing, but he wasn't in the hall anymore. Again, figuring he had just walked fast to the bathroom, I sat down to continue my drawing. Then, a little bit later... I hear him calling my name from the bathroom. As I got up to go see what he wanted, the front door opened and my dad stepped through. When I told him what I saw and heard, we went back to the bathroom, only to see that it was empty and again showed no sign of use. Dad said that this has happened to him before on multiple occasions throughout his years This is the first time for me. Anyone had this happen? Or is it just my dad and me? When I was 12 years old, me and my family got into a bad living situation. We got evicted, and we had nowhere to go. We aren't wealthy by any means, but our family, that's different. My grandparents, to be specific to this story. So after a lot of debating and many fights between my parents and I, they decided that we were going to move in with my grandparents. Where we were living, it had one bedroom a bathroom, a TV, and two beds. Me and my sister would share a bed, and my parents would share the other. Okay, now a big thing is that we have three cats, Ginger, Angel, and Tim, and they were staying in the woodshed, which was up the hill and down a path. And to give a picture of the house, it was three stories, in the middle of nowhere, private property, and gated. There was a password to even get into the driveway, which went up a mountain and took about another 15 minutes to drive. My grandparents had workers that they paid by the hour. Blake, Sam, and Chad. I'd only ever met Blake, and he was really nice. He was 20, and he had a two-year-old kid. One day, when I was going out to feed the cats, I saw a guy come out of the shed, He asked me if I needed a ride back to the house or if I wanted to walk. He said my name and told me that my grandparents had a big Christmas present coming for me since it was around that time of year. 
I said I was good and that I could walk. He said okay, and he gave me the key to the shed. I fed the cats, and then I walked back. At dinner that night, I brought up the man, and my grandparents went white. No one was working that day, and no one, other than Blake, knew who I was. The so-called Christmas present, it was real, but they hadn't told anyone about it. They had the key to the shed, and they even had the spare, which was kept under a gas can in the basement. After that, my grandparents got their guns and went out. They searched the entire property for hours, and they didn't find anyone. How did he know my name? I like Christmas. I like advent calendars. So I found a nice one online and placed an order for it. Beginning of December rolls around. Calendar hasn't come in the mail. So I look for the order in my email to check the tracking number. There's no email. The company has no record of me placing an order. My bank doesn't have any transactions relating to the order. My husband has no memory of me buying this either. He remembers that I told him I wasn't going to be buying an advent calendar this year, which definitely not. I ordered it again, paid extra for rush shipping, and I still don't have a record of the order, despite remembering getting an email confirmation. In fact, now it doesn't even exist on the website. I've scoured all of my records and pretty much I just need to accept I'm not going to have an advent calendar this year. Because mine got lost in the matrix twice. When I was younger... I was terribly afraid of myself. Not exactly how it sounds, but bear with me. This was the early 2000s, and I was having a truly great time in the third grade. I do remember that. I loved my class, my teacher, my new tire swing. But then third grade morphed into a not-so-great time. Mainly for my mom. She got laid off from her job at Ford Motors, which meant that we had to move from our house to a duplex on the other side of town. I have a vivid memory of my mom chopping carrots in the kitchen, telling me that I couldn't complain, that I ought to be grateful we were going to get to have a roof over our heads at all at a time like this. I better be grateful, she'd said, again, as she turned around to look at me. I was grateful, that is. I never did complain, so I think she was the one feeling insecure about it. I do recall the last time I stood outside the old house. I was pretty sad, looking at the tire swing. My mom telling me the day before that I had to leave it, that there was nowhere to put it across town. But I told her I was excited, and I just kept up a good kid attitude about it, best I could. The owner of the building lived on the other side of the duplex from us, She was the mother of a former co-worker of my mom's. A small, elderly woman with four very small dogs. I liked those dogs because they weren't yippy like most small dogs. They all seemed just about as old and as quiet as the woman herself. I only ever saw her early in the morning when I would get the school bus. She would sit out front with all her dogs, smoking a million cigarettes. Just enjoying the quiet, I suppose. Over time, she did come outside a bit more. I think she liked me, and so did her dogs. Sometimes I would just sit out there with her, in quiet, pet the dogs, do some homework. 
And then it was like right when I decided that third grade still had a chance of rocking. That's when things got scary. The first time it happened, I told myself that it was a dream. Just to get through the night and the following day. I'd woken up to use the bathroom one night, and when I went to turn around to dry my hands, I swear I saw my reflection disappear. Like it darted away. But to where? Quickly turning around, I saw my reflection. Almost what I wanted. Except my face was blank. No features. I mean, no eyes, no mouth, nothing. I rapidly rubbed my eyes, and I opened the bathroom door. Now I found myself looking back into the mirror with half of my body out of the bathroom. Everything was normal looking, but it definitely didn't feel normal. I was so scared I didn't even bother turning off the light to the bathroom. That's when I told myself it was a dream, or a dreamlike state. I just needed to go back to bed and wake up in the daytime. Everything would be normal in the morning. One of the first things I heard in the morning was my mom telling me it was time for school. Perfect. That was normal. As I ate my cereal, she came into the kitchen telling me to remember to turn off the bathroom light when I'm finished. She was saying that it must have been on all night since she had to turn it off this morning. She was going on and on about how it wastes energy and we need to be conserving it. But I just kept thinking about the light. Just realizing that that part wasn't a dream. But the rest probably was. My kid brain let me forget about the event long enough to get comfortable again. Until one day I was in the living room, standing, watching TV. The sun was coming through the side window, creating a shadow of me in the living room. I was wiggling around as kids do. And then I would stand still for a moment enthralled by my TV show, repeating this series of motions for a while when I noticed something strange. As I stood still, my shadow moved. I tried to catch it moving, but whenever I would turn to look, it would just be my shadow. I got bored of trying to catch it, and I kept to my show. And suddenly, I felt a small gust of wind behind my ear, like somebody had blown on it. Jolting around, I saw nothing. But more so, I saw that my shadow wasn't moving at all. I turned every which way, but it just stood still. My gaze started to move in a panic, first to the window and then to my shadow and then all over the place. I then became fixated on my shadow. I started to move my arms around like a bird to see if the shadow mimicked that motion. But it didn't. I remember running directly up the stairs to try and tell my mom, but she was in the shower, hollering for me to wait for her to get out because she can't hear anything I'm saying. So I just sat there in her room, on her bed, buried under her covers, trying to wrap my brain around what it was I just saw. By the time I explained it to my mom, it all felt like some sort of dream, and she wasn't convinced either. But this kept happening. My shadow would continuously taunt me, usually just quick enough to make me doubt myself, but plenty of times it was undeniable. There was one night I was grabbing a towel from the closet and heading into the bathroom for a shower. My room was closest to the stairs situated between a closet and the bathroom. As I passed my room, I noticed that I'd seen something. So I stepped back. Looking inside my room, I could see what looked like my shadow. It was my shape. It was where my shadow should be. But it was moving and I wasn't. It was doing different things than I was. As I continued to look on, my fear only grew as it became obvious that the movements were all wrong. The legs slowly started bending in a way that formed a human W. It was truly disturbing to watch, but I couldn't look away. Then, the 
the shadow started to move towards me. The closer it got, the blurrier my vision, until I realized I wasn't having vision problems. I was seeing something terrifying. I was seeing exactly what I'd seen before in my reflection. It was me, but no features. And it was no longer in a mirror. Instead, almost within an arm's reach. But everything in me said to move. Now. And so I did. Not allowing myself to interact any further with this thing. I slammed the bathroom door shut and immediately regretted my choice of rooms. But at this point, I was running out of options. It was like no room was safe in this place. I turned the shower on and I just sat there for a while, not looking in the mirror and waiting for it to fog up before I got into the shower. It wasn't a long shower, and I told my mom I was sleeping in her room and that was that. She entertained me for a few nights, and for whatever reason, I had no issues in that room. We lived in this place for almost a year, so like nine months. The entire third grade, I know that much. Naturally, I had to stop sleeping in my mom's room, per her orders, and I found myself bouncing between my room and the living room. Having more luck in the living room, but being more comfortable in my bed. I'll never forget one morning after a hard night. The old lady was out with her dogs, per usual. We exchanged the normal wave and kept on to the bus. This is normally where our interaction ends, but this morning was different. She called out to me. Keep it up. I asked her what she meant. I think what I actually said was, huh? And then she told me that I know how to be strong and to keep standing my ground. Then she gave me an affirming look. Before I could respond to any of that, she told me that it would all be okay and just keep doing what you're doing. On a normal day, I may have written these comments off, but it was just the night before that I'd chosen to sleep in my room despite being terrified. I felt someone was in the room with me, and the shadows in my room were off. I could tell that one corner was darker than it normally was. Where some light should be, it was absent. I knew the presence and the shadow were the same thing. I could just feel, and even more so, I could hear something. Almost like a dog panting in the corner. It was an obvious sound, but it was also dark. I don't know what it was about that night, but instead of crippling myself with fear, I'd sat up and said very abruptly, Leave me alone. This is my room, and I don't feel like sharing it tonight. Leave me alone. I didn't yell, but it was the most stern I'd ever been at that age. And afterwards, I slept like a baby. In fact, I don't actually recall any other events until the day we were moving, when I saw what looked like a full-blown shadow standing in the front window. So that day, after the woman said that to me, I just looked at her confused, and then, as I recapped my night in my head, I put it together and I smiled at her, just before turning to walk onto the bus. In a cooler world, I had more conversations with that lady and got more information. It seems crazy now, but I never explored the idea of asking her some of my questions. Like, what was I defending myself from exactly? Or, how did she know when I was experiencing something? We moved later that year, and so I wouldn't end up making my way back over there for any reason. But yeah, as an adult, I think it's too bad that I never went down that route. I should have unloaded so many questions because something tells me that she had some answers. What about you? Do you have any answers?
Some background. I was 15 when this happened, and I lived in a house with an upper floor and a complete basement. The staircase to the second floor had no doors at either end. The staircase to the basement only had a door at the entrance, the first floor. Both staircases were L-shaped and had landings separating the turns. The space where the staircases met was as large as two door frames smushed together. At the time, my mom was busy working on her computer on the second floor, and my dad was running an errand, but I didn't know that piece of info until he got home. There was a doppelganger posing as my dad. To avoid confusion, I will refer to it as him in my story. My dad will be dad. So here's the actual story. I went downstairs to the first floor to probably get some water or a snack. I don't remember. As I approached the last few stairs, I caught him exit the basement. He was standing on the hardwood floor of the first floor, only a step away from the door. Being the nice daughter I was, I went to say hi instead of doing my task. As I approached him, he went back down the stairs of the basement in a familiar pace. He wasn't rushed or anything like that when he descended the stairs. Him didn't say a single word to me. I was confused, but thought nothing of it. I followed him, but I stopped by the doorframe. At this point, he had traveled a few steps from the door. Him kept eye contact with me, but angled his body in a way that made sure he wouldn't fall. I was in the process of saying hey to him until I was struck by electricity. This electricity felt raw and alluring, though. It felt sour and so very wrong as it pulsed throughout my body. But it didn't belong in this universe. But not in an evil sense. This electricity had only lasted for a second or two before fading. For whatever reason, I couldn't stop talking. It was like my off switch was broken. I knew that I didn't need to fear him, despite that electricity. Maybe that was why I blathered on. Who knows? I certainly didn't. As I continued to talk, our eye contact never broke. Then, I hear my mom yelling down to me. Who are you talking to? She asks. I yelled back up, I'm talking to dad. After a few moments, I hear my mom walking down to the landing of the staircase, leading to the second floor. She told me that dad was on an errand. Just wanted to remind you that my eyes remained on him while I talked to my mom. Him eventually reached the landing and had his entire body facing me. Then my brain finally began registering what my mom had said. Though, that was short-lived when I heard my dad thumping up the stairs to our porch. My mom was walking the rest of the way down and asked me again who I was talking to. Since she was closer, I looked up to her to respond until I heard the doorknob twist. I looked out to the front door, then turned to face my mom and said, See? I was talking to Dad. Or something among those lines. Coincidentally, my dad had just entered the door when my mom had made it to the first floor. The doppelganger was nowhere in sight when I turned my attention back to the landing. My dad looked so confused as to what I said and my mom's stare. Then I quickly went back upstairs, worried about having to explain myself further. That never happened, but I was still very confused about what had just happened. Sometime between my blathering and my conversation with my mom, I was sitting on the floor instead of standing. I also swear that I saw something like worry or surprise register on him after the electricity. It may have also been wishful thinking. I swear to you guys that this is a true story, and I remember it in vivid detail 
as you could probably tell by reading. I also wanted to add that the doppelganger was in a recognizable outfit. A thick, long, green and white jersey with faded jeans. My dad wore this outfit often, especially during the winter. My dad was in some sort of long-sleeved red t-shirt and lightly worn jeans when I saw him. This has never happened before or since, though I would like to say that the doppelganger loves to taunt me from time to time. There are occasions when I hear my parents' voices off in the distance, then been told that they were on some sort of errands. Sadly, I don't have evidence of it being the doppelganger or a ghost or something else entirely. Have you guys ever come face to face with a doppelganger? This happened back in 1995, when I was approximately 11 years old. My family had a house on a golf course, and my friend, best friend, lived in the houses on the other side of the course. To get to my friend's house, there were paved paths that the golfers used, but it would literally mean walking all the way around instead of just cutting through the center, making a five to six minute walk more like a one minute walk. It was frowned upon, but despite not being as well lit as the actual path, it was quicker and that was the goal. I wasn't afraid of the dark anyways. As I walked back home and ran up the hill, my ears picked up on a low humming noise. It sounded pretty close. I looked over my shoulder and just above my head in the sky, I see a literal spaceship. At least, that's all that I can conceptualize it to be. It's got a round, disc-like shape, bright lights on the bottom lining the craft's circular exterior. It was dark, so that could be why the lights seemed so incredibly bright. I guess the best way to explain them would be that they gave off the same brightness as an LED light. Like most lights, it was blinding to look at. The shape, though... I had for sure never seen something that was actually circular, maintaining position in the sky. I mean, other than a drone, but that's only in the last 10 years, and this was in the 90s. I'm certain that there was nothing, and probably still is nothing like it, on the market. So as I see this thing, it's hard to tell how far away it is. It is closer than I think, and therefore... Something much smaller than a plane. Or was it the other way around? Too far away to really grasp its size. Continuing my walk, trying to keep my cool. But then I realize that this thing is coming for me. I start to feel a bit uneasy, and then it turns to full-fledged fear. When the low humming seems to get closer. And the craft itself seems to be getting closer. The lights brighter. I was sure that it was trying to make physical contact for whatever reason, but at this point, I'm so scared that I start running back to my house. I'm about 30 seconds away from the little walkway that leads to my backyard. I turn around to try to watch the thing, keeping an eye on the distance I've made. But I'm disappointed to realize I haven't put any distance between us, that it's still chasing me, closer than ever. What I can see now is that the craft is definitely smaller than what I initially anticipated. No way that whatever was inside this thing was larger than a small child. It couldn't be more than six feet wide, and the top seemed to have only a small dome, maybe three feet at its tallest point. Either way, I was still terrified at its speed, and more terrified that it seemed to have intent as I stop at the path to my backyard, I can feel this thing is just behind me. The low humming is deafening now. I can feel my whole body begin to vibrate. 
and so much light seems to fill the area in front of me, around me. I can't even see the craft any longer. It's completely covered in white light. I can hardly see anything outside of my own two hands in front of me. I know I'm close to home, so I keep pushing forward. I think I'm running, but I can't tell. And then, in what feels like the blink of an eye, I'm standing in front of my back door with my hand on the door handle. Once that registers, I quickly open the door and run inside the house. My mom greeting me, asking me why I'm so out of breath and what took me so long to get home. I had no idea what to say about why I was out of breath. And when I looked at my watch, I could see that it was almost 10 o'clock at night. But I'd called my mom from my friend's house, telling her I was heading home at nine. Somehow, a one-minute walk turned into an hour. I have no explanation for the lost time, and I can't even decide what it is I think this was. I've never seen anything like that, and I've never had anything like that happen since. I can't even definitively say I believe in aliens, but I do believe that something of intelligence was controlling that craft that night. Really, I don't know what I believe, but I often wonder, if I could get back that missing hour, what would I learn from it? Was it something I'm supposed to forget? Or is it something I'm supposed to remember? Was it something I'm supposed to forget? Or was it something I'm supposed to remember? This was back in the summer of 1994. I was 19 at the time, and I had just gotten my paycheck after working a bunch of overtime. I was pretty pumped up about having money to blow, so I grabbed my keys, my wallet, headed out without telling anyone. I decided to hit up the local convenience store for some munchies, gas, and anything else I wanted. I took my sweet time at the store, and after a long while, I decided to head back home. As I pulled up the driveway, I saw her hanging clothes up outside on the line. I got out of the car and started walking to her. When I looked at her, I could see that she was pale and looked dumbfounded. As I got closer, her eyes widened, and just as I went to say something to her, she took off, running into the house. Confused but also concerned, I ran in after her. I found her standing in the hallway in front of the bathroom door. After a bit of silence, she finally asked me, How did you... She stared and continued. You just went to the bathroom. How did you get... She trailed off. Finally, I got her to calm down a bit and tell me what was wrong. She was asking me a bunch of questions like, When did I leave? How long was I gone? Did I remember her talking about dinner? I explained that I had been gone for over an hour. I had no idea what she meant about dinner, that I just got back. Sort of feeling like she should know this, but also remembering, oh yeah, she's confused. She started to shake a little bit, and I could see goosebumps cover her arms. She told me that, supposedly, there was another me that she had just been talking with, discussing dinner plans, ravioli. And that moments before I appeared in the driveway, the other me excused himself to my mom, saying he needed to use the bathroom and proceeded to walk into the house. I remember that she was very upset about this for a while, and for a long time, if I ever tried to bring it up, my mom would get so pissed, demand that I not talk about it. As of right now, I think she was talking to my doppelganger and that when I got there, my doppelganger vanished inside the house. I don't know.
For the past year or so, I've been noticing that things around me don't seem normal anymore. I continue to have this overwhelming sense that everything is fake, in a way. Or almost dreamlike. I've even kicked around the idea that I may have died already, and I'm in some sort of state of purgatory. I recently took my family on a weekend getaway to Seattle. Being a couple hundred miles away from our home in Celia, Washington, it's an easy trip for my wife and I to manage with our two kids, 11-year-old and 4-month-old. Over the course of our weekend excursion, I experienced a few things that I found to be odd and left me feeling a bit uneasy. The first occurrence was trivial enough, but it sort of set the tone for the eeriness of the weekend. I was gazing out the window of our hotel room on the 12th floor, sipping a cup of coffee, when I noticed a plastic bag drifting in the wind. I watched the bag dance around in the air as it slowly descended. A green dumpster, 12 stories below, caught my eye, and I immediately thought, what if that bag floated all the way down there and landed in that dumpster? I stood at the window for five minutes or so, watching the bag slowly float towards the ground. Gliding left, right, back and forth, the more I watched the bag, the more confident I became that it would find its way into the dumpster. And it did. This bag that I noticed off in the distance drifted 12 fucking stories and perfectly navigated its way into the dumpster below my building. Later that day, I was in the hotel lobby approaching the elevator to head up to my room. In front of me, there was a man with two children waiting for the elevator as well. The man had a guitar case strapped to his back, along with an amplifier and various other bags. His back was to me and he had a hoodie on. For some reason, I thought to myself, what if that's Ed? Ed was a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in years. We used to work at an olive garden together in our younger days. We also played guitar together and did a fair amount of partying. Now, here's the weird part, and my wife thinks I'm fucking crazy, but bear with me. The weird part was how confident I was that this guy was going to turn around and it would be Ed. The same confidence, almost certainty, I would say, that I had in that trash bag flying into the dumpster. The elevator door opened, and the man and his two children walked inside. As the man turned around to enter the floor number on the elevator button console. It should not have been Ed that I recognized, but it was. It was fucking Ed. We were both thrilled to see each other and even held the door open to chat for a moment, hindering other folks in the process. Even as this was all occurring, though, I couldn't shake this feeling that this isn't real. It's a very difficult thing to describe, but things just don't feel real. Later that evening, my 11-year-old son and I were on the balcony outside of our hotel room. He was peering over the edge when he suddenly whimpered out underneath his breath. That poor guy. When I asked him who and what he was talking about, he said, that bumblebee on the ground next to the dumpster, he's dead. We were on the 12th floor, like I mentioned earlier. There's no fucking way this kid could see a dead bumblebee on the ground floor. Not to mention, the alleged bee was laying next to the dumpster that was the manifested landing zone for the floating trash bag. We argued a bit over whether or not he could see the bee when he finally convinced me to go down and take a look. As we made our way down to the street level, my thought process shifted. The same confidence that I had previously regarding the bag and Ed was back. Although I didn't mention it to my son, I was becoming increasingly certain that the bee would be there. And well, it was. It was fucking there, right next to the green dumpster containing the trash sack. The next evening, I took my family to a place called Gameworks, which is similar to a Dave and Buster's or an adult version of Chuck E. Cheese. I placed our car keys, wallets, and other important shit into our diaper bag backpack, and we carried it into the establishment. 
We spent a couple of hours playing games before finally counting our tickets and claiming prizes at the prize booth. We pocketed the prizes and went down the block to a cheesecake factory for dinner. After being seated for a few moments, my wife realizes that I don't have the backpack on. The backpack containing all of our money, credit cards, car keys, and not to mention food and supplies for our four-month-old. The bizarre thing is that I have no recollection of ever taking the bag off. Apparently I did because it was gone, but I could have sworn up and down that I never took it off. I immediately go into a panic mode, leap up from the table towards the GameWorks establishment. I run inside and dart around frantically for about a minute or two, with the bag nowhere in sight. Finally, I calm down and focus. After breathing and focusing for a moment, I'm greeted with that same confidence that I mentioned before. I was confident that I would not leave that place without that bag. And at that moment, a man approached me waving his arms in the air, calling me by my first name, saying, Here, Cody. I've got your bag, man. Now get back to the Cheesecake Factory and enjoy your dinner. I was awestruck and definitely beside myself at that moment as I had no fucking clue who this man was or how he knew my name or where I was eating dinner. I didn't even think to question the man. I reached out, grabbed the bag, and left. This might seem coincidental to a lot of you, but these are just recent examples of how my life unfolds daily. Either I'm a walking conduit of coincidence or something larger is at play. My wife thinks I'm nuts, but things are definitely not the same as they used to be. I don't know exactly how or why, but they just aren't. Things just don't seem real. This happened two years ago, when I was still living with my parents. I love my parents, but they can be slightly overbearing, and frequently I found myself wanting or needing to get away, just to have time to myself. I had been hanging out with a friend, and after I had dropped him off, I drove to the graveyard. I'd go there a lot to enjoy the silence, day or night. But this night, I had kind of a creepy feeling when I pulled in and ended up heading home instead. As I was waiting at the stoplight near my house, I looked over at the car next to me, and it was my dad in my dad's car. He had a very tired look on his face. He seemed sad. We made eye contact, and I gave him sort of a goofy, hey, what the heck are you doing, wave. He just looked at me. I was wondering why he didn't wave at me or act like he actually saw me. I also wondered why he didn't have his hat on. He never leaves the house without wearing one. Why the heck was he out so late? He's usually in bed or getting ready for it at this time. I didn't see my mom in the car. He was all alone, looking very sad. The light changed and my dad took a left toward town and I went straight towards our house. When I got home, my dad's car was in the driveway. That's literally not possible, I said out loud to myself. I walked in. He and my mom were in the living room with the TV on. I just stood there staring. They asked me what I was doing, so I told them what I saw. They said they had never left. They had been there all night. My mom told me that she'd also seen someone that looked like my dad in my dad's car in that same area. And when she called him to see why he didn't wave at her, he told her that he wasn't even in town yet and was just leaving work. It wasn't him. My dad joked that maybe I'd seen a dream version of him since before I walked in, he was sleeping in his chair, dreaming about driving to work. What the...
This was a very long time ago, in Tacoma, Washington, when I worked at a place that was called Cameo Theater. I remember it was the month of April. The year was 1976. I can't recall exactly the time, but I know that it was past 10 as the theater was closed for the evening. Doors locked, sign off. But likely before 11, since I was closing up the till and was normally done by that time. As I was closing, I kept noticing the same man, an army man in uniform. That was not the unusual part. In fact, our theater chain showed fairly tame adult films, catering largely to the military population from what was known as just Fort Lewis at the time. No, the unusual part was that the same man appeared to be walking the same block half a dozen times or more. He seemed to be making his way back around rather quickly. Probably lost, I said out loud to myself. That was common as well. Most people on the base weren't necessarily from here. My coworker was also my ride, so once I finished up the till, I waited for him at the front desk, and I kept watching the man. He kept doing the same thing, walking around the block, but then he stopped walking. He looked around for a minute before landing his sights on the theater. He then turned his body and began to cross the street. Then, the strangest thing happened. Everything outside, in the street, it seemed to get blurry, as though my eyes went out of focus for just a moment in just that spot. And the next thing I knew, the man was now standing in front of the ticket counter inside the theater lobby. He suddenly looked wobbly, like he couldn't keep his balance. He was holding his head and hunching over. I gasped and he didn't react, just stayed hunched over, rubbing his forehead. I wasn't sure what to do and I kept hoping my coworker would just show up at any moment. The man finally looked up at me and he seemed as surprised as I was. Sir, how did you get in here? I asked the man. He just looked at me, then looked back at the doors, back at me. He didn't say anything, like he didn't know the answer. He started to walk toward the counter and instinctually I backed away. I guess a little more afraid, I asked again, Sir, how did you get in here? Are you okay? He looked up at the wall behind me trying to focus on the clock hanging there. As he got even closer, he started to mutter, what time is it? I didn't even answer the man. Instead, I grabbed my stuff and walked into the back room where my coworker was. I told him that there was a guy in the lobby, that I had no idea how he got in, and that was all I could get out before he started running for the front entrance to meet the guy. When we got out there, the man was just standing at the front desk. And before he could say anything, my coworker grabbed him by the arm, pulled him toward the entry, unlocked the doors, and shoved him outside. He told the guy that we were closed and to get out of here. He came back inside, relocking the doors, and we waited in the lobby for the man to leave. He just stood there, looking bewildered staring up at the open sign, which was not illuminated, rubbing his head. And as he does this, I start to tell my coworker how the man just sort of appeared in the lobby after just moments before being all the way across the street. The doors were locked from the inside and outside, so to get in, you'd need a key, and to leave, you need a key. The man still hadn't left, and it was getting to be almost midnight. So my coworker unlocked the door again, opened it, this time saying, look, I don't know how you got inside with the door being locked, but you better leave right now. The cops are on the way. The man still looked confused, but slowly started to walk away. 
We hadn't actually called the police, but it did seem to get the guy to leave. To this day, I still don't think that the man meant any harm. In fact, I don't think he even has an explanation for how he got into the theater that night. And I'm not sure which one of us was more afraid. <laughs> 